To help build my case that these men were undertrained, it's worth mentioning that senior engineer Toptonov was only 25 years old. And he was in charge of a nuclear reactor. Terrifying. Welcome to A Popular History of Unpopular Things, a podcast designed to make history more fun and accessible. My kind of history is the unpopular stuff. Disease, death, and destruction. If it's bloody, gross, or mysterious, I'll cover it. For today's episode, we're going back to Russia and more specifically the Soviet Union. Now, I've already covered the Dyatlov Pass incident, where in 1959, a group of experienced Soviet hikers died mysteriously in the Ural Mountains. But today's story is a lot more well-known and more recent. Today, I'm going to teach you about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. So most people by now have at least heard of Chernobyl. A lot of you may have even seen the HBO series about it, a brilliant piece of filmmaking that stars Jared Harris and Stellan Skarsgård, among other incredible actors. But if you haven't heard about Chernobyl, or don't know much about it other than what the name of the incident implies, then you are in for a treat today. In the early morning hours of Saturday, April 26, 1986, Unit 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in northern Ukraine, part of the Soviet Union, exploded. It was not a nuclear explosion, but a chemical reaction that caused the reactor to melt down. It was, without a doubt, the worst nuclear power plant accident in history. Way worse than when Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania experienced a partial meltdown in 1975. Way worse than Fukushima's disaster in 2011 when an earthquake triggered the tsunamis that caused the nuclear accident there. No, Chernobyl was the most disastrous of them all. Today we're going to explore the scientific and historic context of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. I want to teach you about how nuclear power plants work, how the Chernobyl plant was supposed to function, how the explosion happened, the fallout, the Soviet attempt to cover it up, and the state of Chernobyl today. So, in short, we've got a lot of learning to do. But Chernobyl is a fascinating case study of how human action can cause massive destruction. Now, don't get me wrong, the science of nuclear energy is sound, but in inexperienced hands, it can be deadly. So let's take a look at the history of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Let's start with the hard stuff. We need the scientific context here to understand what went wrong. I'm not going to use too much jargon to explain things. Let's break down how a nuclear reactor works, specifically the type that the Soviet Union was using at Chernobyl. Because once we understand this, it will be easier to see how everything went wrong. For you nuclear experts out there, I won't be giving every single detail of the physics and chemical reactions at play, only what we need to know to understand the event. I'm a historian, not a scientist. So first, what is the purpose of a nuclear reactor? Well, they're meant to provide electricity without needing to burn fossil fuels. Here's how it works. So like a steam engine, the purpose of a nuclear reactor is to heat water enough to create steam. That steam is then used to spin the blades of a turbine, which generates electricity. Steam engines work on the same principle, but they burn coal to heat the water and make this process happen. So the goal behind nuclear energy was to make this process cleaner, and we do that using atoms. Nuclear power plants typically use uranium atoms. We use one particular isotope, or form of uranium, called uranium-235. 235 undergoes fission really well, which is how nuclear energy works. Fission is when you split an atom in half, and in this case, we're talking uranium-235. I'm just going to call it uranium from now on to keep it simple. So when uranium is split, when fission happens, it produces heat, among other things. Immense amounts of heat, and this heat is what's used to boil the water to generate the steam that eventually provides electricity. Okay, sounds great. So how do we make fission happen? How do we split uranium atoms apart? Well, we fire neutrons at the atoms. You may remember neutrons from science class. 
Neutrons are one of the three subatomic particles that are in the nucleus of every atom, along with protons and electrons. Neutrons are really dense, and they exist in almost every element, just not hydrogen. And when the neutron collides with the uranium, it splits it, causing fission. So to recap, nuclear power plants work by firing neutrons at uranium, causing fission, which releases a massive amount of heat. That heat then boils water to create steam, which powers the turbines that generate electricity. Now, in addition to creating heat, fission also releases more neutrons from the now split uranium, so the process can continue. As long as we provide uranium as fuel and start the process of nuclear fission, it can continue on and on without much intervention. There will always be more neutrons to bounce around once the process has started, and the reaction will generate the heat we need to provide electricity. But there are a lot more factors to consider, like speed. For the neutron to hit uranium and cause fission, it needs to be going relatively slowly, actually. Interestingly enough, if neutrons are flying around too fast, they are unlikely to hit their target. So this means for fission to work, to split apart the uranium atoms, we need a way of controlling the speed at which neutrons bounce around. We call this moderating. We need moderators to control fission to make it happen. So, simply enough, we need to slow the neutrons down. I really like the way Illinois energy professor David Ruzik explains it. Neutrons are born fast. Fission can only really happen when you slow them down. So, shout out to Professor Ruzik. He is incredibly knowledgeable, and his YouTube videos are really great lectures for those of you interested in learning more. I'll put the link to his channel in the description for this episode. Or just look up Illinois energy prof on YouTube. So, moderators are used to slow down the neutrons so we can make fission happen. Water is the best moderator. When super-fast neutrons hit water, the collision will reduce the neutron's speed. For those of you interested in why, it's because of the hydrogen in H2O. Hydrogen's mass is equal to the mass of a single neutron, so when they collide, the neutron slows down. That slower neutron is now more likely to hit the uranium and therefore start fission. Carbon, in the form of graphite, works okay too. It needs to be pretty pure, though. If there are other elements in there, like boron, the neutrons will be absorbed instead of slowed down, which defeats the purpose. We need the neutrons to be bouncing around to create nuclear fission. We'll come back to boron later, though, because that's important to the story. Okay, so let's recap. We want to create nuclear fission by shooting neutrons at uranium, causing the uranium to split, which generates heat, among other things, like more neutrons. To make this happen, we need to moderate the speed at which neutrons fly around, and we do this with a moderator. So, most of the nuclear reactors in the world now use water as a moderator. Not only can it moderate the speed, but it also serves as a coolant. It helps keep the core, where the fuel is kept, from getting too hot. We can then also use this water to produce steam, which gives us the electricity. So, it's great. It's both the moderator, the coolant, and what will eventually turn into steam to produce electricity. So again, the trick is to moderate the speed of neutrons so they cause fission. We use the heat to generate electricity, and the neutrons that are released as a byproduct of fission keep the reaction going. This is what we call a chain reaction. As long as we start the process and moderate it correctly, the reaction will continue on its own. Water is the best moderator because it's also the fail-safe. The water that moderates the speed of the neutrons is the same water we're trying to boil to generate electricity. So if you lose that water, you lose the moderator. This would mean the neutrons will once again go super fast and the reaction stops. Because remember, we need them slow to work. We call this a negative void coefficient. Super jargony, I know, but this means that when water boils off into steam, the reactor will lose power because there is less moderation. If the water turns to steam, there is nothing to slow down the neutrons, right? So if the reactor is too efficient, it will actually become less reactive. Adding more water will allow for more fission, so we need to constantly pump water into a water-controlled nuclear reactor.
But let's talk about graphite moderators. If we use graphite or carbon as the moderator and water as the coolant, there could potentially be an issue if you lose the water. Okay, so let's say the water is gone, right? Because water is not the thing keeping the neutrons slow, the neutrons will still create fission if you lose the water, because it's the graphite that's moderating the reaction here, keeping the neutrons at the speed needed for fission. This heat will keep generating even without the water, but without water to help keep it cool, there's nothing to stop the reaction from getting hotter. We call this a positive void coefficient, and this is important for our later conversation about what happened in Chernobyl. When there is too much fission, too much heat, and therefore too much steam, the reactor power in graphite-moderated reactors will increase because there is still graphite used to moderate the neutrons. So, in other words, the graphite moderators allow for fission to happen even if there isn't enough water. The reactor will just get hotter and hotter and hotter and power levels will rise. So, what happens if we need to control this power? What if we make too many neutrons and we need to remove some? Well, that's what we have control rods for. A control rod is made of material that absorbs neutrons. Boron, which I mentioned earlier, is really good at absorbing neutrons. If the neutrons are absorbed, then they're not flying around causing fission, right? So control rods exist to control the power of the reactor. There are other materials that are good at absorbing neutrons, but let's keep it simple and just stick to boron. So those are all the main components of how nuclear reactors work. We want to create electricity by turning turbines, but without burning fossil fuels. Coal and oil are bad for the environment, and they are a finite resource, right? We'll eventually run out of them. So instead, nuclear reactors use fission to create the heat needed to produce steam and therefore electricity. Fission is when neutrons split uranium atoms, and we can make this happen by slowing down the neutrons using moderators. And just in case the reaction is happening too fast and we build up too much power, we also have control rods to absorb some neutrons and lower the power of the reactor. That's the gist of it. Hopefully I've explained and recapped it in a way that makes sense, because to understand what happened at Chernobyl, we really needed that crash course in nuclear energy. So, back to the history. In the 1930s, physicists conducted experiments that created fission for the first time. Well, fission done intentionally by man, at least. Italian physicist Enrico Fermi bombarded uranium with neutrons, which we now know causes fission. Other European scientists conducted similar experiments and got the same result. Essentially, and I'm very much simplifying this because I don't want this podcast episode to be the length of a college semester course, they found that fission produces heat. This got the scientific community all excited because they recognized the potential for creating energy through fission, a self-sustaining chain reaction where neutrons could break uranium to produce heat and more neutrons, which would go on to do the same thing theoretically forever. The first successful nuclear reactor, where fission became self-sustaining, went online in December of 1942 in Chicago. And this marks the beginning of the nuclear age. Now, unfortunately, much of our focus on fission and nuclear power went towards weapons. Why? Well, come on now, 1942. That's World War II. The U.S. was already at war by this point. Remember that this was post-Pearl Harbor. You might know or recognize terms like the Manhattan Project, which is when we developed the atomic bomb. But world events changed after World War II. The U.S. unleashed nuclear weapons on the world with the dropping of two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th and August 9th, 1945, respectively. And after World War II, our biggest enemy was no longer Germany or Japan, but the Soviet Union. Since the birth of the U.S., we've been a democratic country founded on the principles of the Western Enlightenment. We as a country value capitalism and individual freedoms. I know that we're also incredibly flawed, as are these systems, but that's not the point of today's episode. We wanted a government run by the people for the people. But the Soviet Union did not. In 1917, 
a communist revolution began in Russia to take power away from the monarchs that ran the country. And it was successful. A group known as the Bolsheviks took power under Vladimir Lenin. Once in power, Lenin and the Bolsheviks promised to distribute goods equally to the people. Men like Lenin and later Joseph Stalin became the leaders of a state built on the premise that the Communist Party knows what's best for the people, and so therefore, the people must follow the party blindly. It was a bureaucratic organization built on secrets and lies, but one that became a powerful example to the other nations of the world who are anti-capitalism, or at least anti-Western. Shortly after World War II ended, the U.S. and the Soviet Union entered into a period of heightened tensions known as the Cold War. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Soviets recognized the U.S. as a threat, one that had the power to destroy if we wanted to. So they developed nuclear technology as well, both weapons and energy. But unlike American nuclear power plants, which were water-moderated, the Soviet Union built graphite-moderated power plants. So let's turn our attention to the type of reactor used in Chernobyl, the RBMK-1000. Chernobyl's nuclear plant was a graphite-moderated reactor. At the time of the incident, they had four operating reactors. Each contained a core of uranium fuel surrounded by graphite moderators inside a big cylindrical tank. So picture like a paint can or a water tower or something, right? A big cylindrical tank. Inside this tank were vertical uranium fuel rods surrounded by bricks of graphite to serve as moderators. And then we've also got pipes that ran water through the reactor core. Remember, we need the uranium fuel to undergo fission, which is why the graphite moderators are there to slow those neutrons down. And then the water goes through, the water heats up, it turns to steam, it helps generate electricity. Water also helps keep things cool so the reactor core doesn't get too hot. From the top of this tank, 211 control rods are inserted down into the core. The control rods are used to help regulate the power, right? They contain elements like boron that absorb the neutrons in case they multiply too quickly and produce too much power. At any given time, there are always some control rods inserted to help make sure everything is running smoothly. It's a basic safety feature. You have to have some of the control rods in. The whole thing is surrounded by a concrete shield to help block the radiation that comes from fission. Unfortunately, you can't watch this thing in action, as the process creates an immense amount of ionizing radiation. It's energy that can travel at the speed of light and will actually destroy parts of your DNA. Exposure to ionizing radiation for too long will cause your cells to weaken and die, which will lead to an agonizing death. Ionizing radiation can also cause cancer as your cells mutate and grow abnormally. Now, the curious thing about this setup, as we discussed earlier, was the use of graphite as a moderator instead of water. It creates that positive void coefficient, so if all the water turns to steam because it gets too hot, the reactor will only grow more powerful. Remember that in our western ones, the water is also the moderator, so without water, the neutrons move too fast for fission to happen. But this was not the case for Chernobyl. It also didn't help that the Russian reactors, like the RBMK in Chernobyl, did not have what we call a containment shield, meaning there was no other larger failsafe keeping this thing locked up tight in case of an incident. But if something were to happen to the reactor, and they needed to shut it down quickly, they had something called the AZ-5. In the show, they call it AZ-5, because they're all British, and the British say Zs, like Z. It's also known as a SCRAM, it's a rapid emergency shutdown of the nuclear reactor, a kill switch, if you will. If one were to push AZ-5, in theory, all of the control rods would be inserted at once into the core, absorbing the neutrons, breaking the chain reaction, and stopping fission. Okay, so AZ-5 is the emergency shutdown. So now that we know the basics, what went wrong with the Chernobyl reactor? If you've been paying attention, you may probably think that the graphite moderator and that positive void coefficient may have something to do with this. 
something about the fact that even without water, fission can still happen, only getting hotter and hotter, generating more and more power, and you'd be absolutely right. But before I reveal the fatal flaw of the RBMK reactor, let's take a look at the night in question. It's time to introduce some characters into our story. The head of the Chernobyl power plant was a man named Viktor Brukhanov. A Soviet engineer, he helped build and run the plant. Though he wanted to install water reactors, the Soviet government overruled him in favor of their own model, the RBMK, only used throughout the Soviet Union. As is common with a lot of Soviet science and engineering, corners were cut, things were rushed, materials were defective. Journalist Adam Higginbotham, who wrote a brilliant book about the incident called Midnight in Chernobyl, says it best. Quote, The quality of workmanship at all levels of Soviet manufacturing was so poor that building projects throughout the nation's power industry were forced to incorporate an extra stage known as pre-installation overhaul. Upon delivery from the factory, each piece of new equipment, transformers, turbines, switching gear, was stripped down to the last nut and bolt, checked for faults, repaired, and then reassembled according to the original specifications as it should have been done in the first place. Only then could it be safely installed. End quote. Birkinov was so overwhelmed with how poorly this construction project was going that he even tried to resign back in 1972. But the Communist Party refused and sent him back to finish the job. The plant was eventually done in 1977, and the fourth reactor went online in 1984. However, one thing that Birkinov and the other high-ranking engineers were not able to pull off before officially turning on the reactor was one of several safety tests. Under Brukhanov, who was in charge of the factory, was Chief Engineer Nikolai Fomin. Brukhanov was given orders to carry out this safety test, who passed them on to Fomin. He approved the test and then gave responsibility to Deputy Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov. More on him later. Nothing to do with the Dyatlov Pass incident, by the way, in case you listened to that episode, it's just a happy coincidence. So the test was all about power. In case the power went out, maybe if they were attacked by the U.S. or something, backup generators would kick in to keep the reactors running. Great. But those generators took anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds to fully turn on. So what would happen to the reactors in that time? We needed to make sure the water pumps were working to keep that reactor cool in that crucial time before the generators kicked in. The theory was that the turbines, as they were shutting down, would still generate enough electricity. The test was to see if that residual energy could keep the water pumps moving while the generators were powering up. Now, before the night in question, Brukhanov, Fomin, and the other men in charge had attempted this test three times, and the test failed every time. Under pressure from the party headquarters back in Moscow, Brukhanov had to make this test happen. Fomin assured him that it would because their jobs were on the line. It was scheduled for the afternoon shift on April 25th, but it was pushed back because factory operators in nearby Kiev couldn't handle a drop in power in the middle of their workday. Fomin reached out to his deputy engineer, Anatoly Dyatlov, who decided to run the test in the middle of the night. And that was the first problem. The night shift was not told that they were running the test until they arrived for work that night. The night shift was not trained on how to run this test. The night shift was a mix of both experienced nuclear engineers and newbies. In order for this test to be completed, the reactor had to be operating at 700 megawatts. Without context, this means nothing, so let me help a bit. The reactor was designed to run at 3200 megawatts. To prepare for the test, the power level had been brought down to half capacity, or 1600 megawatts. It was brought to half capacity in time for the original start of the test, which was the afternoon of April 25th. But when the test was postponed, the engineers decided to just leave the reactor running at half power. Without knowing more, this doesn't sound like a big deal, right? Just produce less energy for a while, then do the test later. Ah, well, here's why that actually caused more problems. 
Remember that fission is when neutrons split up uranium atoms. It's what produces heat, which then later becomes electricity, right? I also told you that during fission, more neutrons are released from the split uranium atoms. But in addition to heat energy and neutrons, splitting a uranium atom also creates an isotope of xenon called xenon-135. An isotope, for those of you who slept through chemistry, is an atom with a different number of neutrons. Xenon normally has a mass of 131. Xenon-135 has four more neutrons, making it heavier, and it's also really unstable. In fact, it's often called nuclear poison, because Xenon-135 is the most powerful neutron absorber that we know about, and it comes from fission. Now normally, when a reactor is operating as it should, Xenon-135 will burn away. But if the power level drops, or the control rods are in for too long and lower the power of the reactor below a certain threshold, Xenon-135 will not burn away. So what does this mean? This means that the excess Xenon-135 will absorb the neutrons, and the power levels will drop even more until the reaction is basically dead. For someone trying to run a power plant, you don't want this to happen. Now back to the test. Reactor 4 was running at half power for hours, about 10 hours in fact, and in that time, since the power level was below the threshold for too long, Xenon-135 had built up in the core. The core was poisoned. Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov entered the control room after midnight and instructed his men to start the test. They were given an instruction booklet, but again, none of them were properly trained. The two men who were tasked with carrying this out were Unit Shift Supervisor Alexander Akimov and Senior Reactor Control Engineer Leonid Toptunov. To help build my case that these men were undertrained, it's worth mentioning that Senior Engineer Toptunov was only 25 years old. And he was in charge of a nuclear reactor. Terrifying. To begin the test, Dyatlov instructed the men to lower the power to 700 megawatts. Akimov and Toptanov slowly lowered the power as they were taught to do, which took some time, like more than an hour. But suddenly, the power started to drop unexpectedly. They didn't know at the time, but the xenon poisoning had started to take over at this point, absorbing all the neutrons needed for the power to happen. The reactor was in danger of shutting down. It reached a low of 30 megawatts at one point. Now, what they should have done was postpone the safety test. Once a core is poisoned, operators need to slowly bring the power up over a long period of time to burn away the excess xenon. It reminds me of scuba diving. If you go really deep, you can't just shoot back up to the surface when you're done because you'll get the bends. It's called decompression sickness. You have to slowly resurface and there's a whole process for that, right? Professor David Ruzik describes the cardinal rule here. If the power is too low, you need to wait three days before turning it back up because of xenon poisoning. But Dyatlov and Fomin and Brukhanov were under pressure to get this test done, so Dyatlov ignored all safety procedures and told the men to bring the power back up through whatever means they could. So how do we put power back into a reactor? Well, we need the neutrons to do their thing, right? So the men removed almost all of the control rods that are designed to absorb neutrons and lower the power. Now, they had just spent about an hour adding them slowly to the core to bring that power down, but now they were told to bring the power back up again. They removed all but six of the 211 control rods. This is bad. You have to have a certain amount of control rods in the core to maintain balance. But doing this brought the power back up to 200 megawatts. And although it wasn't the 700 megawatts needed for the safety test, Dyatlov told his men to start the test anyway. So they shut down the turbines to do this test, which meant that the water was not pumping through the core as it was supposed to. What this did was actually increase the amount of steam. There was less water pumping into the core, but the core is still pretty hot, so the coolant pipes contained more steam than water. The steam even filled the void left behind when the water wasn't being pumped in. 
and as the pipes heated up because of the steam, it only caused the core temperature to rise as well, and this created a power surge. There was no water to cool the core, and there were few control rods there to absorb the neutrons. But remember, there was graphite, because the RBMK was a graphite-moderated reactor. So you've got hot uranium fuel with graphite around it, meaning the neutrons are free to bounce around at the speed required to trigger fission, and almost no control rods to keep it in balance. So what to do? All of a sudden, the power started to dramatically rise, like beyond the capacity of the reactor itself and the relatively inexperienced operators didn't know what was happening. Normally, control rods are used to moderate power levels, right? We know that control rods made of neutron absorbers like boron are meant to kill the power. Okay, so they triggered the kill switch, the SCRAM, AZ-5. But what Dyatlov, Akimov, and Toptunov didn't know was that the Soviet control rods used in the RBMK reactors had a fatal flaw. To save money, the boron control rods were tipped with graphite, the same material that makes it possible for fission to happen. So when 205 control rods were simultaneously inserted into the core, the first things that met with this surgeon reactor were 205 pieces of graphite. And though the control rods are meant to reduce the power in reaction, the graphite tips instead increased it. It also didn't help that the graphite tips displaced the water in the channels, making the reaction even hotter. The result? A steam explosion. The power surged so high that fission was happening at an incredible rate, and the resulting steam had nowhere to go. The reactor exploded. But again, it's not a nuclear explosion, it was a chemical explosion. The roof of the reactor blew its top, a 2,000 ton metal plate that exploded upwards into the air and ultimately fell back down into the reactor hall, causing massive damage. Pipes burst, walls collapsed, chunks of burning graphite flew into the air, landing on the roof and the surrounding area outside the reactor building. Hot graphite, now exposed to the air, caught on fire. A second explosion occurred. Scientists have a variety of opinions on what caused the secondary explosion, but the result is clear. The reactor core was now exposed, and ionizing radioactive particles were flowing freely into the air, hastened by the graphite fire spewing out from the reactor hall. In the aftermath of the explosion, Dyatlov was in shock. Despite evidence to suggest the reactor had just exploded and the core was now gone, he refused to believe it. He sent some of the men from the control room to manually open the cooling system, which would send water into the reactor, which no longer existed. And in the process of doing so, many plant operators were exposed to incredibly deadly and high levels of ionizing radiation. For those of you who have seen the HBO miniseries, it makes it seem like they started to bleed and show symptoms of radiation sickness immediately, which isn't the case. But many of the men who were in that control room, and the men who were operating the reactor from the main hall, died from acute radiation sickness not long after the incident, some just a few days later. One poor man, Valery Kodemchuk, was in the water pump engine room and died immediately in the explosion. His body, or if anything remains of it, is just interred there to this day. When the coolant system was manually turned on, all it did was flood the basement and hallways with contaminated water, as the reactor had just exploded, right? There's nothing to cool. It was also incredibly hot near the reactor, so dumping water on that fire just turned it into radioactive steam as the hydrogen and oxygen separated and combusted. The local fire station was called and told to come put out the fire burning at Chernobyl, but they weren't given any information about what had happened, and the administrators barely believed it themselves. Nobody believed an RBMK reactor could explode. The nearby town of Pripyat was built alongside the Chernobyl power plant. It was known as an Atomgrad, a town built only for plant operators and their families closed off to other residents. But within these Atomgrads, residents had everything they needed, including schools for their children. 
The Chernobyl Power Station Fire Brigade was called out, but not knowing how deadly and radioactive the area was, they all absorbed lethal doses of radiation. One of the fire engine drivers gave a pretty terrifying account of the event. Here's what he described. Quote, We arrived there at 10 or 15 minutes to 2 in the morning. We saw graphite scattered about. Misha asked, is that graphite? I kicked it away. But one of the firefighters on the other truck picked it up. It's hot, he said. The pieces of graphite were of different sizes, some big, some small enough to pick up. We didn't know much about radiation. Even those who worked there had no idea. There was no water left in the trucks. Misha filled a cistern and we aimed the water at the top of the building. Then those boys who died went up to the roof. Vashchik, Kolia, and others, and Volodya Pravik, they went up the ladder, and I never saw them again. End quote. The firefighters were told to extinguish the fires on the roof, so the nearby third reactor would not be impacted, and they managed to do so by 5 a.m. But the graphite fire inside the reactor hall, now a crater filled with nuclear fuel, continued roiling. A team was assembled to sort out the mess, including ending the graphite fire, cleaning up the area, and, of course, trying to keep things secret. For the Communist Party, the absolute worst-case scenario was the world finding out that Soviet science and engineering had failed, particularly the Americans. To that end, they shut Pripyat's borders down and kept the people there, trying to make it seem like business as usual. It was two days before the party relented and evacuated the city, and in that time, many of Pripyat's residents contracted lethal doses of ionizing radiation. There were many members on this team, but the two we'll focus on are Communist Party Chairman Boris Sherbina and chemist Valery Lagasov. If you've seen the miniseries, these are the two main characters played by Stellan Skarsgård and Jared Harris, respectively. The first order of business was to put out the graphite fire. It was pumping fatal amounts of radiation out every second, so they had to find a way of stifling it. Water wouldn't do. The fire was so hot that it combusted the oxygen and hydrogen in the water, making things worse. Legasov came up with the idea of dumping a mix of sand, boron, and other neutron-absorbing elements into the reactor core. The sand would stifle and suffocate the fire, and the boron would help absorb the neutrons to prevent more chain reactions. Shabina made some calls, and teams of helicopters spent days dumping the sand from above. It was tough, though, because the helicopters couldn't fly directly over the burning crater of the reactor hall. They had to use the wind and try to dump it in at an angle. They didn't know it at the time, but much of the sand and boron actually missed the mark. Regardless, they did eventually get the fire extinguished, but the danger wasn't over. To simplify and shorten this story a bit, they also had to clear all of the radioactive debris from the roof and the surrounding area. They had to mine underneath the reactor core to prevent nuclear fuel from melting down into the grounds and local bodies of water. They had to send men diving into the depths of the basement to drain all that coolant water Dyatlov ordered his men to release after the explosion. It was a logistical nightmare, and it cost the Soviet Union millions of rubles. But what really fascinates me as a historian is the cover-up. The Soviet Union willingly let people play around in the nuclear fallout because they didn't want the outside world to know what happened. They didn't want to cause a panic. And as it turns out, Chernobyl was not the Soviet Union's first nuclear incident. In 1975, a concrete tank at the newly built Leningrad nuclear power station west of St. Petersburg exploded. Less than a month later, a cooling circuit in one of the units broke, and contaminated water was released into the environment. Later that year, a fuel channel wasn't getting any coolant, so it experienced a partial meltdown that released radiation for about a month. Nobody nearby was warned, so people were exposed to the radiation it never made the Soviet news. The reactor at the Leningrad plant was also an RBMK reactor. The first, in fact. The commission that investigated the incident made recommendations for improving RBMK safety, but they were not implemented, and the whole affair was just buried. So when digging into what happened at Chernobyl, scientists, along with Valery Lagasov, discovered the truth that the Soviet Union knew about the potential dangers of the RBMK reactor, but didn't do anything about it and told nobody of the fatal flaw with the AZ-5 kill switch. Why? Why? 
Why would a government knowingly put its own people in harm's way? That's the point of government, to give people a safe place to live, to look after its people. Well, in short, power and control. Going back to the Cold War, our historical context for the Chernobyl incident, the Soviets were always in direct competition with the Western world, particularly the United States. They needed to prove that the Soviet model, a communist state kept under lock and key with the party controlling every aspect of its citizens' lives, was equally as advanced as Western capitalist democracies. If the Americans could build nuclear reactors and advance nuclear weaponry, then the Soviets could do it better. The Soviets prided themselves on their secular commitment to science and technology. To deny Soviet science was to deny the power of the state itself. So to tell the world that the Chernobyl reactor exploded because of substandard technology, that definitely wasn't going to happen. Pripyat was closed down, and the party kept a close eye on the people involved with cleaning up. That is, until a power plant in Sweden detected unusually high levels of radiation outside its facility. They detected the kinds of isotopes and elements that only exist inside the core of a nuclear reactor, telling them that a nuclear accident had to have happened, and it didn't take long before it was traced back to Chernobyl. Now, initially, the Soviets went on damage control, though they refused to outright admit that an explosion had taken place. Here's what their original message was to the outside world. Quote, There has been an accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. One of the nuclear reactors was damaged. The effects of the accident are being remedied. Assistance has been provided for any affected people. An investigative commission has been set up. End quote. Notice how there was no reference to an explosion. In addition to this, the Soviets started to give mitigating arguments, like how the Three Mile Island incident in the U.S. back in the 70s was way worse than Chernobyl. Spoiler, it wasn't worse than Chernobyl. This is classic Soviet misdirection, often called whataboutism. Instead of answering a question or criticism, the Soviets gave counter-questions or criticisms. Well, okay, our reactor had an incident, but what about Three Mile Island? Right, instead of answering questions about Chernobyl, they just spouted information about how the Americans had messed up before them and how American nuclear power was weak in comparison. Remember, Soviet prestige is the most important element of the state, so the propaganda machine was strong to paint the Soviet Union above the West in all ways, including minimizing the severity of Chernobyl. And as the cleanup efforts continued, the Soviets sent Valery Legasov to a meeting of the International Atomic Energy Agency, better known as IAEA, in August of 1986. There, despite knowing that the RBMK reactors had a faulty design, Legasov pushed the narrative that the plant operators made the errors that led to the explosion. And while Dyatlov and his men skirted around safety protocols, which was definitely a factor in the explosion, the bigger problem was the graphite-tipped control rods, which the state knew about and still didn't warn its nuclear engineers. Perhaps because he was pressured by the party, or because he himself was a ranking member of the party and wanted to maintain prestige, Legasov didn't tell the public about the Soviet government's cover-up and deceit. It would have meant his death, despite his strong standings in the Soviet science community. He managed to convince the world that the IAEA that this was a one-off mistake caused by human error and that it wasn't as bad as it sounded. It worked. The world was comforted. Later, in July 1987, several of the men involved in the incident were tried in criminal court. Alexander Akimov and Leonid Toptunov, the two men in Dyatlov's midnight shift that pushed AZ-5 and triggered the explosion, had died from acute radiation sickness. But those who survived, including Viktor Brukhanov, Nikolai Fomin, and Anatoly Dyatlov himself, were all found guilty for their role in the explosion. Dyatlov, perhaps the man most responsible for the negligence that happened in the control room that night, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for criminal mismanagement. He only served three years. During the trial, the truth about how the Soviet state covered up the RBMK fatal design did come out, and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev wanted to make it public knowledge. He was overridden, though, and the truth never made it past the courtroom. Such is the power of the Soviet communist machine. Now, around the same time as the trial, Gorbachev wrote that, quote, 
Chernobyl made me and my colleagues rethink a great many things. The accident, its global discussion, and disastrous fallout across huge Soviet areas shattered the Soviet militarized mentality to the core. The lessons of Chernobyl called for the reversal of secrecy and xenophobia for fundamental rethinking of security in the nuclear age. End quote. It's important to know the historical context to understand why Gorbachev would so radically go against what the party believed about maintaining secrecy. Around this time, he was trying to enact a policy known as Glastnost, essentially trying to make the state more transparent. The people were growing less trusting of the communist state and its secrecy, and Chernobyl only exacerbated the people's mistrust. Though Gorbachev wanted to enact change, the secretive Soviet state was less willing. Gorbachev himself was given little information about what happened at Chernobyl for several days after the event, which gives us a good understanding of how bureaucratic and corrupt the Soviet system had become in the final years of its life. In 2006, Gorbachev attributed the Chernobyl nuclear disaster and the ensuing cover-up as a major reason for the fall of the Soviet Union in 91, stating that, quote, the nuclear meltdown at Chernobyl 20 years ago was perhaps the real cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Chernobyl disaster, more than anything else, opens the possibility of much greater freedom of expression, to the point that the system as we knew it could no longer continue. It made absolutely clear how important it was to continue the policy of Glastnost, and I must say that I started to think about time in terms of pre-Chernobyl and post-Chernobyl. End quote. The cleanup, containment, and decontamination efforts cost the Soviet Union more than 188 billion rubles, which is equivalent to $2.9 billion today. This put the Soviet Union into bankruptcy, which was one of the inevitable factors of its decline. So what's the state of Chernobyl today? Less than a year after the incident, engineers created a cover to seal up the radioactive chamber and all the debris. Once all the radioactive graphite was piled into the reactor, and other cleanup efforts ensured that radioactive fuel wouldn't burn down into the ground, a sarcophagus was constructed to seal up Reactor 4, that's what they called it. However, like other Soviet engineering projects, it was poorly built, and it started to show cracks not long after its completion. Not wanting more radiation to escape, or even worse, see a chain reaction begin anew, a new containment building was built to cover the sarcophagus and radioactive contents inside of it, and it was installed in 2016. It cost around 2.2 billion euros, and was called the New Safe Confinement. It's supposed to last for 100 years, so if you're still alive in 2116, let us know if it's still around. To this day, Pripyat and the areas surrounding the Chernobyl power plant are still unsafe. Tourists are now allowed to visit, but they can't stay too long without risking dangerous exposure to ionizing radiation. The place itself has become overgrown, with wild animals reclaiming the lands that was abandoned in the wake of the disaster. It's estimated that the area will be inhabitable for a minimum of 100 years due to the amount of radiation and fallout from the explosion of Chernobyl's reactor number 4. Thanks for joining me for this episode of A Popular History of Unpopular Things. My name is Kelly Beard, and I hope you've enjoyed the story of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Thank you for supporting my podcast, and if you haven't already checked out my other episodes, go have a listen. Follow my podcast wherever you listen to them so you know when new episodes are dropped, and stay tuned for my next episode to get a popular history of unpopular things.